I am the Lord. Thank you, thank God, when you got here with you. I want to ask you to do something with me tonight. Take your Bible, open it up. If you have your Bible, take it, open it up just like this. Open it any verse. In fact, open it to your favorite verse of Scripture. Open it right now to your favorite verse of Scripture. Just hold it open right there. We got a lot of Bibles in the house tonight. There's power in God's Word. When I was in school, I was studying evangelistic preaching faster. And the teacher told me that when you're preaching evangelistically, at least once each sermon, hold your Bible up like this and point to it while you're preaching. So one time he did, did that, people told me that there were rays of light shining out of his Bible into the audience. So he said, hold up your Bible like that. So hold your Bible up with me and let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask you by the power of your spirit now to illuminate this word, this word you've given us. And may the light of it shine upon our hearts, each and every one of us. May the power of Jesus Christ, as proclaimed in his word, be in this place. May Christ himself be exalted and magnified, not just in the words we speak, Lord, but in our thoughts, in our hearts, in our sentiments. May Jesus Christ be lifted up, and may everyone here be drawn to him, and to him only, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 For 25 years in the United States, the Barna Research Group has been conducting surveys on the state of Christianity in America. Each year, at least one major survey, asking various questions of Christians in the country to see where our beliefs lie and the places of strength and weakness. A few years ago, they did a study among Christians regarding the reading of the Bible. And they surveyed various Christian denominations, major denominations, and asked the members of those churches, how often do you read the Bible when you are alone? Not at church, not at Sunday school, not in prayer meeting, but just you alone. How often do you read the Bible when you're alone? And on average, only 38% of American Christians say that they read the Bible on their own. The rest only read the Bible when they are in church. Therefore, they only get someone else's interpretation of Scripture because they never read it for themselves. For many Americans, the survey concludes in the summary, for many Americans, religion is like snacking. We don't really think about it, but we do it out of habit and without much passion. And we don't study the Bible, we're easy victims to deception and fall into false teaching. Biblical doctrine is meant to protect us from deception, to keep our minds in a clear path where the Holy Spirit can speak to us. When we don't understand Bible teachings, we are easy prey to false teachers. And we can, even with sincere hearts, live crooked lives because we don't understand the Word of God. Another Barna survey, 2009, revealed something shocking, a shocking statistic regarding Christians and their knowledge of the issue of spiritual warfare. In summary, the survey said that 7 out of 10 church-going Christians in America either do not believe or are doubtful that Satan is a real living being. Seven out of ten Christians. Most believe that he's just an influence or a psychological condition, but not an angel, an evil angel from the spirit realm who is walking about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Most American Christians do not believe that. When you don't read your Bible, you're an easy prey to deception.
But Satan is not a fiction. And in this message tonight, we'll witness a critical battle in the war between good and evil known as the Great Controversy. I want to use the title, He is Able. Take your Bible now and join me in Mark chapter 1, the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark, beginning with verses 21 and 22 to start. Keep your Bible at hand. We'll be referring to other verses as we go along. We're starting with this one, Mark chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. He is able. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. As our story opens this evening, it is the dawn of a new age for the children of men, a new dispensation in salvation history, the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth has officially begun and the world will never be the same again. They enter the synagogue together in Capernaum, the Bible says. By the time he's done collecting, he'll have 12 disciples. But here, in the early part of his ministry, there are only four, the two sets of brothers, James and John, Peter and Andrew. These five together enter the synagogue in Capernaum. The setting is familiar to them. They've attended synagogue services all their lives. And Jesus has decided that this is the best arena to begin his ministry. The missioner provided that a synagogue should be built wherever there were ten adult men. And so every city had at least one. Unlike the temple, the synagogue had no professional clergy, no paid minister, no trained priest. The synagogue service was supervised by a lay leader who would choose any competent male to participate in the service. The liturgy was simple, consisting of three parts. There was the praise, there was the prayer, and then there was the instruction in the word, just three elements of worship. The praise took place as a call and response between the church and the worship leader. The prayer occurred in two parts called the Yotzer and the Shema. But the most distinctive feature of synagogue worship, worship was the instruction, the reading and exposition of the word of God. The center of synagogue worship was the Word of God. First, they would read the parasha, the Torah, followed by the haftarah, a reading from the prophets. The scripture would be read aloud, and then the reader would sit down and teach from the passage he had just read. In the synagogue, the reader, the preacher, always preached from the seated position. On this day, the scroll is handed to Jesus, and he does not hesitate. He takes his place before the people and begins to read the words concerning himself. This is his element. This is his domain. Nobody exceeds him here. The word written is declared by the word made flesh. The way is spoken by the one who is the way. The secrets of heaven are revealed by the one who came down from heaven. The light is shed abroad by he who first said, let there be light. And oh, what it must have been to listen to Jesus preach. Can you imagine? As he speaks, the people are captivated with his spiritual power. Silence falls over the room like a blanket. Even the little children are quiet as he speaks. They sit in rapt attention as in a trance. 
leaning forward in their seats like a forest under the power of a hurricane, captivated by the voice of the one who speaks the words of life. There is something in every human soul that longs to hear the words of life. And when the genuine word is heard, people are captivated by it, even those who have just small faith. They're captivated by the power of God's pure, unadulterated word. Jesus has the house under his power. Mark uses a particular word to describe the reaction of the people to the preaching of Jesus. In the English, it is translated astonished. We just read it. It says they were astonished at his teaching. In our language, that word means to surprise or to stun somebody. But in the original language, the word translated astonished actually means to be struck as by a blow. To be struck as by a blow. The teaching of Jesus then is so powerful that it's like a cold slap in the face. And I want us to notice the Bible says he's particularly contrasted with the scribes. They are the religious scholars of their day and Jesus has not even gone to school. But their teaching is uninspired and his teaching is full of life. When Jesus speaks, souls are fed and spiritual hankering is awakened within. His teaching proceeds from the very throne of God. Even his enemies who go out to entrap him come back scratching their heads saying, never a man spake like this man. And the Bible makes it clear that the source of his power is not personal charisma or clever rhetoric. It is spiritual power from on high. He walked and talked with the Father, and the Spirit of the living God spoke through him. And beloved, to this day, the cause of God needs such women and men. Whether clergy or laity, the Word of God needs people who will speak the truth in love by the power of the Holy Ghost without holding anything back. And it makes no difference to God who we are. God is no respecter of persons. He will use to his glory any willing person who gives his or her heart sincerely to him. You and I can be that person. God will use us if we're willing. He'll use everyone. But there's one qualification of which I always remind us when we're seeking to do ministry for God. Whatever form that ministry takes. The Lord will use us for his glory in a mighty way, even when we don't realize we're being used, provided we don't care who gets the credit. See, that's the problem with some of us. We want to do God's work. We want to be recognized for it. We want somebody to notice. We want somebody to call our name, give us a plaque, say something great about it. God can't use us if he has to compete with us. But if we don't care if we're noticed or not, if we don't care if anybody says congratulations, if we don't care if anybody calls our name, then God can use us in a mighty way to his glory. We won't even know how much he's used us until we reach the other side. But he'll use any willing person. Who says amen to that? Amen. Suddenly now in Mark 1's story, the story takes a dramatic turn. And the element of controversy is revealed. When Jesus reaches the part in his sermon about his mission to set the captives free, there is a sudden outburst in the middle of the service, 23 and 24. It says, now there was a man in their midst, in the synagogue, with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The voice shrieks through the corridors of the synagogue, sending a chill up everybody's spine. The deacons do not approach him to restrain him. 
No usher moves to calm him down. The people gasp and instinctively take a step backward, gripped this time by a silence of another kind. Not silence based on awe, but this time silence based on fear. This is not just some disturbed individual who forgot to take his medicine. Something deeper is going on, and one look in his face reveals it. His eyes are ablaze with the fire of insanity, and evil presence exudes from him, tainting the atmosphere, haunting the synagogue. Mark says he has an unclean spirit. Luke calls it the spirit of an unclean devil. His mind is not his own. He has lost the control of his faculties. Another power has taken charge of him, taking him where he does not want to go, doing things through him that he does not want to do. He's a shell of the man he used to be, a wretch of a man, not even a whole man, more like an animal than a man. Dead while he's alive. A spiritual zombie. Servant of God says, the man saw in Jesus someone who could help him. And when he stood up in the midst of the synagogue, he meant to cry out for help. He wanted to pray. But she said the demon came and took control of his vocal cords. And instead of crying a prayer, shouting the words we just heard, he wouldn't even let the man pray. He had so much control over him. A total slave. Immediately, Jesus is confronted with a personal challenge to his authority. Everything he has been saying about himself must now be put to the test right before this crowd. This is a showdown. The great controversy in miniature. Contested over the soul of a single man. And the destiny of every human being weighs in the balance. Not just this man. This is not just the story of one man. It's the story of every man. And the outcome of Mark 21 still means today as much as it meant in the first century. And even more. Because today, we are on the brink of the end of the world. In the time of Jesus, there were more cases of demon possession than at any time in the history of the world. In response to God's salvation initiative, the devil was aroused to intense activity. He claims this world as his own. It is determined not to give it up without a fight. He hates the plan of salvation. He hates God's Son and opposes him with all of his might. He has one occupation day and night, and that is to destroy human souls. This is all he cares about and all he ever tries to do. If he could have his way, he would cause each one of us, under the sound of my voice, to lose our eternal salvation, which Jesus paid for by his blood. He's the enemy of human souls. But our Lord made this world and everything in it, and he has a claim of his own to defend. He has a prior claim because he made us and then redeemed us. And it has to be noted that while he was here, whenever demons came into the presence of Jesus, they always lost their power. Amen. Even before he spoke to them or challenged them, they trembled in his presence. This is First Thessalonians, I'm sorry, this is Testimony for the Church, Volume 1, 296. The name of Jesus, our advocate, he, Satan, detests. And when we earnestly come to him for help, Satan's host is alarmed. It serves his purpose well if we neglect the exercise of prayer, for then his lying wonders are more readily received. When we go to Jesus and call on his name, the host of hell are alarmed. They're terrified. 
just by the thought of the name of Jesus. The servant of God says in the last days, Satan once again will be aroused to intense activity. As God pours out his spirit upon us in latter rain power to complete his work in the earth, to give us the final victory over sin, the devil at the same time is having his own latter rain. While new life and power is pouring down from above on the servants of Jesus, new life and power is emanating from beneath, energizing the servants of Satan. And in these last days, Satan's masterpiece of deception is spiritualism. And it has taken hold of the entire world. We are in a controversy, a great controversy of good and evil. And we must be aware and alert of what the state, what's at stake in our day and time because unseen to human eyes, there is battle raging all around us every moment. And our only safety is in the hands of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Based on the lie of natural immortality, the lie which Lucifer began in the tree in the Garden of Eden, the false teaching of spiritualism has become universal in our world, impacting every religion and every culture. In the last 10 years especially, we have seen an explosion of interest in the paranormal. Spiritualism has come into its own in a postmodern revival. It has been suddenly intellectualized to meet the modern needs of a scientific age. Nearly every major university today in the West has parapsychology somewhere in the curriculum. Public schools are experimenting with transpersonal education. Telepathy, karma, astral projection, transcendental meditation, telekinesis, chiromancy, the third eye, channeling, harmonic convergence, it's everywhere in our society. It's replete in the culture. Police departments are consulting spirit mediums. Professional athletes are being hypnotized before going into contests. Entertainers are hiring personal spiritual guides to guide their careers and their lives. World leaders are governing by the horoscope. Sick people are turning to psychic surgeons. The unconventional has become the convention, and the nature of public thought is being changed right before our eyes. In the meantime, seven out of ten Christians don't even believe the devil is real. The stage is being set for the final deception, the overmastering deception that will take the whole world captive. Jesus said, if it were possible, it would capture even the very elect. The stage is being set. The world is going to be deceived. What about the church? This same Barna Research Group I referred to earlier conducted a survey of teens and the supernatural, also in the United States, 2006. A survey of teenagers and the supernatural. These are some of the results. 73% of teenagers they, they um, interviewed said that they, that they had experienced at least one witchcraft-related event in their lives. 73%. 30% said they have had a palm reading. 27% said they had their fortune told. 25% said they had played a game featuring sorcery. More than 2 million teens in the United States said that they have communicated with a dead person. And nearly 2 million claim that they themselves possess psychic power. Now, if this is the state of our teenagers, who are going to be taking the role of leadership in the country as the years go on, if this is how they are being indoctrinated and taught and trained in their 
very impressionable teenage years, then what kind of trouble do you think our world is in for? We're in a battle. We're in a controversy. It's a great controversy. And our only safety is in the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son. Who says amen to that? Amen. He is our security. A few years ago, Oprah Winfrey introduced on her television program a man named Eric Butterworth, a unity cult minister. That's what he calls himself, Eric Butterworth. And these were her words on her program. She said, Jesus did not come to teach how divine he was. But he came to teach that there is divinity within us. Then she praised this man's book entitled Discover the Power Within You, calling it one of the greatest books she has ever read. She read a quote from the book. Here's what it said. Christ is not a person, but a principle. Jesus discovered the Christ principle within himself, but revealed it as a principle that involved all humanity by revealing the new dimension of divinity. This she calls the greatest book she has ever read. And in America, Oprah Winfrey has a powerful influence on the culture. I don't know if you're aware of that. There is an important distinction between having Christ in us and having the so-called Christ principle within us. It's a subtle distinction, but it's important. If you don't read the Bible, you would never pick it up. Are you hearing me, church? If you don't read your Bible, you would never notice the difference. There's a big difference between having Christ in us, that's biblical, and having the so-called Christ principle within us, that's the lie, that's the deception. The first idea glorifies God, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The second idea glorifies self. Divine power is within me and is nothing less than idolatry. The word of God never makes a difference between Jesus and the Christ. Jesus is the Christ, the one and only. In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is, Jesus is not from God. 1 John 4, 3 says, this is the spirit of Antichrist. The most basic tenet of salvation is righteousness by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Take this away and replace it with faith in yourself, and you have destroyed everything that constitutes true religion. And this is the aim of spiritualism. The enemy wants our faith to be in him, not in Christ. Idolatry has always been about faith in what the self can do instead of in what God can do. Servant of God says this, I was, I was mentioning this earlier to the pastor. The servant of God says, the nearer we reach, we get to the end of time, one message will swallow up every other message. You know what that is? Let me say it again. The nearer we get to the end of time, Ellen White says, one message will swallow up every other message. You know what it is? The Lord our righteousness. The Lord our righteousness. The closer we get to the end, the more that message shines. The Lord, our righteousness. Not faith in yourself, but faith in Jesus, our only hope of salvation. Who says amen? amen. amen. This is the third angel's message. Parents, you want your children to be saved? Teach them this, that they can and they must depend on Jesus Christ. Jesus is everything, and everything is already ours in him. It is not self-faith. It is faith in Jesus that brings salvation. 
Ellen White comments in the story on the man in Mark 2. She explains that this man had been living selfishly in deliberate sin. That's what made him vulnerable to the enemy's attacks. That's how he came possessed. So totally dominated, in fact, that he couldn't even pray. Here's where deliberate sin presents a danger to us. Not the sin of weakness or the sin of mistakes, but deliberate sin. When we go headlong, consciously, into deliberate rebellion against God, we make ourselves vulnerable. That's what this man did, not once but repeatedly. He lived to himself in deliberate sin, and eventually, gradually, he gave himself over to the powers of darkness. And he could not extricate himself. And here is where Mark's story becomes so important for us. For you see, this is Christ's first encounter with a demon-possessed man. This is the beginning of his ministry. You meet many demons along the way. We know that story, but this is the very first time. Nobody knows what's going to happen yet because this is the first time. What will happen in this showdown? The question becomes this. How far must Satan take a man away from Christ to get him beyond the reach of salvation? The whole universe is interested in that question. Even holy angels are on the edges of their seats, waiting to see what Jesus is going to do. The Lord steps forward as the crowd is falling back. He has not a shred of fear. He, pulls, he puts aside the scroll now that he has been teaching from. This is no time for reading. It's time for action now. He squares off in the center of the synagogue with the multitude surrounding him with bated breath, their eyes like saucers, waiting to see what will happen next. And as we with them look at the two men standing in the center of the synagogue, we see a stark contrast, a study of human nature and its full potential. On the one side is the wretched man, robbed of his intelligence, filled with lunacy, dominated by the evil one with no power to help himself. On the other side stands Jesus in all the glory of perfect manhood, filled with the spirit and the fullness of God. His powers are under his control through the submission to the Father. Make your selection tonight, church, because every one of us is going to become one of these two men. Because the controversy ends with only two sides. Those who are totally for Jesus and those who are totally against him. When the controversy ends, there are no more undecideds. And everyone right now is moving in one direction or the other. Make your choice tonight, church. Where are you going to stand? The demon has declared himself. It's Christ's turn now to respond. Everybody waits, but they don't have to wait too long, and they don't expect what they are about to see. The demon has shrieked and cried and screamed, but Jesus simply speaks a short, curt command. Be silent, he says, and come out of him. Nothing more. No incantations, no conjurations, no hocus-pocus, no waving his arms. Just a simple sentence, be quiet and come out of him. Not another word. And suddenly, there's a violent shaking in this man as inhuman shrieks come out of him as the demon tries to hold on to his slave. But the force of Christ's words has a power that no demon can withstand. It is the same word that spoke the world into existence. And the enemy cannot overcome it. He shrieks and shrinks, but he has to go. And the man is set free, rejoicing and praising God. And all the people look and say, what 
kind of man is this? For even demons obey his voice. It is the Lord, it is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and He is our Savior. Bless His holy name. Amen. And we have an answer to our question. How far does Satan have to take a man to get him beyond the reach of Christ? There is no place the devil can take a man that is beyond the reach of Christ. Amen. No one is so vile. No one has sunk so low. No one has been so dominated by his own sin that he cannot be delivered by the power of God's word. The man in the story was so dominated that he could not even pray. But nonetheless, the heart, the prayer in his heart was heard by Jesus. Even though he couldn't put it into words, the prayer in his heart was heard by Jesus. And Jesus answered his prayer and set him free. There's hope for anybody in this house, even if you've been overwhelmed by sin. There is no place the devil can take a man where the Lord Jesus cannot reach him. Amen. Glory be to his holy name. Amen. So when God says, at the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host trembles. The weakest sinner on his knees is more than a match for the entire host of hell. And I love this part of the quote. Listen to this. She adds this. God would send every angel in heaven rather than allow one sinful, sincere soul to be in bondage. God would send every angel in heaven rather than allow one sincere soul to be held in bondage. Oh, bless his name. What a God we serve. Amen. A couple of years ago, a few years ago, I just thought of this story. We were living in Southern California. After church on Sabbath, we went to a friend's house for lunch. And some other friends were coming there too. And one couple came in later than the rest of us. And they were so excited with the story they had to tell us. They had, they had worship at a different church than we had that morning. And they wanted to tell us about the worship service they attended. They said they were watching the service. And the husband had his video camera taking a recording of the service that day. When they got home from church, they decided to watch the videotape for a minute just to see that, it had, that he had copied everything right. And as they watched the videotape, they saw something on the tape that they had not seen with the naked eye. Behind the preacher, while he was preaching, they could see two angels in a fierce struggle fighting behind him back and forth. One, they said, was a dark angel with a long, drawn-out face. The other one had long hair to his shoulders, and they were fighting with each other right behind the pulpit during the worship service. They said they were moving so fast you could hardly see, and then they would suddenly stop like they were catching their breath. And then they would go out like this again, going at it, going at it, and then they would stop. And finally they said they went through a, a skirmish, and the, the holy angel pinned the evil angel down and sat on top of him and crossed his legs and folded his arms, and the man of God went on preaching. Amen. Look at this. They left home full of excitement. They decided to go back home and get the tape to show it to us. And when they got there, they could not find the video camera. It was gone. But they had already seen it. Two witnesses. Two witnesses. They'd already seen it. And our faith in Christ was confirmed all the more. Amen. We have a powerful Savior who is mighty to save. The forces of darkness can do all they want to do. All we have to do is have enough faith to call on the name of Jesus. Amen. And the weakest prayer from the weakest saint will call forth all the powers of heaven to defend us. Listen to me. Jesus Christ did not go through the agony of the cross, the suffering, the dying, in order to see us get all the way to this point and be lost now because we're weak. Christ will not let us be lost as long as we keep our faith in him. Amen. 
It is his responsibility now. When we come to him and give him our hearts, he makes it his responsibility to see to it that we are saved. All we have to do is keep our faith centered in him. Who says amen to God? Amen. I want to read just one or two more quotes to you, and I'm going to wind this up. I've written down eight or nine quotes from Ellen White where she's talking about this spiritual warfare that's going on and how we as believers can come out victorious in this warfare. Let me pick a couple to read to you. Maybe you want me to read all nine, I don't know. Let me, let me pick a couple of them here. This one is from Prophets and Kings, page 513. He who walked with the Hebrew worthies in the fiery furnace will be with his followers wherever they are. I love that right there. Just that right there is enough for me. Will be with his followers wherever they are. He'll be with us. His abiding presence will comfort and sustain. In the midst of the time of trouble, trouble such as has not been since there was a nation, his chosen ones will stand unmoved. Satan, with all the host of evil, cannot destroy the weakest of God's saints. Angels that excel in strength will protect them. And in their behalf, Jehovah will reveal, will reveal himself as God of gods, able to save to the uttermost those who put their trust in him. Who says amen to that? Word? That's Prophecy Kings 5.13. I love that one. i got to give you this one. Ministry of Healing, 253. We are not to dwell on the great power of Satan to overcome us. Often, we give ourselves into his hands by talking of his power. Let us talk instead of the great power of God to bind up all our interests with his own. All heaven is interested in our salvation. The angels of God Thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000 are commissioned to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. They guard us against evil and press back the powers of darkness that are seeking our destruction. Praise the Lord. It's a beautiful promise too. I got to read this one. I'm trying to wind up. I got to read one more. Testimonies, volume 5, page 293. He, Satan, knows more than we do the limit of his power and how easily he can be overcome if we resist and face him. Easily. He knows how easily he can be overcome. Through divine strength, the weakest saint is more than a match for him and all of his angels. <laughs> Praise God. Through divine strength, not through our strength. The Lord, our righteousness. Not me looking for power within myself. That's a lie. That's a deception. The devil wants us to believe that. No, by divine strength, the weakest saint is more than a match for, for the devil and all of his fallen angels. We have nothing to fear when our faith is in the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. He will not let us down. He will not fail us. He will not leave us exposed. Sometimes when I'm tempted to think, listen to me now, sometimes when I'm tempted to think that I'm not worthy of God's protection, I remember what it means to be a father. Fatherhood taught me a lot about Jesus. And I think to myself, if one of my children was in danger, I would go anywhere. I would do anything to protect them. Am I better than God? If that's how I would be as a sinful father, a sinful man, how much more is Jesus going to keep his eye on us and not let anything happen to us that he will not see us through? He is our faith. He is our strength. He is our power. This is the next page. Volume 5, Testimony 294, the next page. It is only through Christ that Satan's power is limited. I gotta read that one again. Again, this is the answer to the lie. When you don't read your Bible, 
you're susceptible to the lie. Easily deceived if you don't know what the Bible teaches. Easy. You know why? Because Satan is subtle. He mixes a little truth with a lot of error. And people swallow it down whole thinking that they're hearing the truth. Sometimes just one word is off. And the message is turned into a lie. If we don't read God's word, we have no hope of escaping the deception. The deception is too great. But the light of truth is in the power of this word. Paul, no, David says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. The power is in that word. It is only through Christ that Satan's power is limited. This is a momentous truth that all should understand. Satan is busy every moment. Going to and fro, walking up and down in the earth, seeking whom he may devour. But the earnest prayer of faith will baffle his strongest efforts. Then take the shield of faith, brethren, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Okay, I gotta stop with this one for real. <laughs> This last one, for real. Testimonies, volume 1, 345. This is a long one. But if the one in danger perseveres, and in his helplessness casts himself upon the merits of the blood of Christ, our Savior listens to the earnest prayer of faith and sends a reinforcement of those angels that excel in strength to deliver him. Satan cannot endure to have his powerful rival appealed to, for he fears and trembles before his strength and majesty. At the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host trembles. He, listen to this, he continues to call legions of evil angels to accomplish his object. And when angels all-powerful, clothed with the armory of heaven, come to the help of the fainting, pursued, pursued soul, Satan and all his host fall back, knowing well that their battle is lost. It's already lost. The battle's done. We already have a victor. And we have a chance to pick sides. Jesus paid a dear price to give us a chance to pick sides. Because when sin first came into the world, we had already picked our side and we were all condemned. But Jesus came and died to give us a second chance to pick sides again. Right now, tonight, we got a chance to pick sides. The battle's already settled. The victor's already been declared. We have a chance to pick sides by the grace of Christ tonight. I don't know about you, but it's an easy choice for me. Yeah. I don't need to think about it twice. And listen to this now. I want to challenge you with this. We do have to pick a side. But if we pick the side of Christ, it's going to cost us to do so. So Jesus says, before you come to me, he says, count the cost. It's going to cost you something. No, no. It's going to cost you everything before he's done. So Jesus says, you better think about it before you come to me. He says, I'm going to give you all my grace, all my power, all my love, all my protection, all my strength. But you have to give me all too. Not all for me and some for you. No, all of me, but also all of you. It's going to cost you everything to be one of my disciples. So count the cost before. Pick a side, but pick with your eyes open. If you choose the side of Christ, it's going to cost you to make that choice. I don't know about you, but I don't care what it costs. I want to be with Jesus. It is not a hard choice for me. And on nights like this, when we're together in God's house, the Spirit of God is here. The holy angels are around us. On nights like this, on, listen to me now, on nights like this, we can think more clearly than at any other time. We can't recreate moments like this on our own. 
The Spirit of God is here to honor the gathering of the people. And in this context, in this atmosphere, our minds can think more clearly than at any other time about spiritual verities and what's at stake in the great controversy. So we have a chance on a night like this to make a decision, a decision that will set and seal our eternity. And we cannot put it off and say, I'll get back to you later. We don't know if we're going to have a later. All we know is we got now. This is our chance. We can pick sides tonight. I'm going to give you a chance tonight by the grace of God to pick a side. And look, here, listen, let me tell you something. And Pastor James said, this is why I love being a preacher. You know why? When I get the chance to say at the end of a sermon that on the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, I now offer you eternal salvation in his name. And based on his promise, it is available to whosoever will. Just the chance to say that to a house of people is worth all the stress and work of being one of Christ's ministers. I say it now on his authority, based on his word. It's not my word, it's his word. He taught me to say to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, that if you choose tonight, you can have all of your sins erased and have your name written in the Lamb's book of life tonight. No matter what you've done, you have that choice tonight if you simply confess your sin and put your faith in Jesus. And the Bible says, whosoever will may come. Now, if you can get a better deal than that from any place else, you take it. But that's the best arrangement I've ever heard of. And tonight, tonight, you have a chance to make a choice. Think carefully. Choose wisely. Because your eternal destiny is at stake. This might be the last chance you have to make a clear thought choice like you're having right now tonight. Don't take it for granted. Don't let it pass by. Make a decision now while you can, this night. Make a decision for Jesus. It's a decision that will require you to give up your sinful ways. It's a decision that will require you to repent and confess your sin. But it's a decision that will place you in the upper echelon of heaven, right beside the Lord Jesus himself. As soon as you make the decision, he becomes your defender. He becomes your lawyer. His blood becomes your covering. And every promise he ever made in the Bible becomes a promise for you. The moment you decide you're going to make him your Lord and Savior. You have that chance tonight. I'm going to give you an opportunity right now. Let's do it this way. Let's take a moment first to pray. Let's take a moment first for silent prayer. I'm going to give us 20, 30 seconds for silent And in that prayer, use that prayer to search your own heart. Silent prayer. After 20, 30 seconds, I'm going to make a call. I'm going to give you a chance to respond publicly to the invitation of Jesus Christ to confess your sin and become one of his children. Let's close our eyes now and pray for just a few seconds. Holy Spirit, help us now to do the right thing. My beloved, if in your heart tonight you feel the conviction of the Holy Ghost and you feel drawn to make a decision for Jesus Christ, whatever that decision might be, you search your own heart and ask yourself, what is it God would have me to do? As you do that tonight, if you feel drawn to make a decision for Jesus Christ and to ask Him to be the Lord of your life, I want to invite you right now in that decision to stand to your feet 
and show Jesus that you want to be his completely. Leaving every sin behind, every wayward way, every sinful habit, every sinful deed, confessing everything to him. And saying, Lord, come in now and be the Lord of my life. Maybe tonight in this house there's somebody who has been under demon oppression. Not knowing what to do. This is your chance too to claim the healing and the power of Jesus. Stand to your feet if you want to make that claim right now. As the Holy Spirit moves you. Let it be Him leading you and no other influence. Just the Holy Spirit. Listen to His voice. Search your own conscience. Make a decision for Christ. God bless you as you stand. God bless you. Right now in heaven, holy angels are taking names. They're recording right now the names of everyone who has taken a stand for Jesus. Those names go into a record in heaven. And those persons now qualify for a new status with God. Perfect in Christ. All sin washed away. Perfect in Christ. Names written in the Lamb's book of life. That response is going on right now in heaven. That guardian angel who's been watching over you all your life, that angel's rejoicing right now that you're on your feet. And if you haven't taken your feet yet, that angel right now is encouraging you to make a decision now for Jesus while you have the chance. Don't worry about what other people think. Doesn't matter what people, you can't control what other people think. Worry about now. Worry about what God is thinking of you. And take a stand for Jesus now. Maybe the first time in your life. Take a stand for him now. God bless you as you stand. God bless you. Now, I want to pray a prayer of confession and of consecration. They call it the sinner's prayer, the prayer of repentance. I want to pray that prayer. And as I pray it audibly, I want you to pray that prayer in your heart. And after I have prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask the whole house to stand. We're going to make a circle around this tent, and we're going to pray a prayer of the sealing of God's Spirit on every person here, protected and safe from all the power of the enemy and all his intentions for our lives. That's how we're going to close this service tonight. First, I want to pray the sinner's prayer. Father in heaven, we stand to our feet tonight with nothing to bring to you except our repentance. And we come, Lord, with repentant hearts. We say to you in the name of Jesus, Father, we have sinned against you and we are sorry. Forgive us, we pray. We have no excuses, no explanations, no rationalizations. All we have is a repentant heart. Lord, give us true repentance. Make it deep, make it sincere as we try to confess our sin to you right now. We say to you, Lord, look into our hearts and know us. Know us to our core. Come in with your cleansing power and wash away our sin. And then by that same blood that cleanses us, we pray, empower us to live the new life. To walk in the way of right. To follow your spirit. As you lead us, each and every one of us. But you know us, Lord. You know all about us. You know all of our secrets. We need you now. We know you're the one we can depend on. Hear our prayer, we pray. Forgive us, cleanse us, and accept us as your own. And then help us, Lord, to live our lives only for you. Then we know you'll be pleased with us. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Now, church, stand with everybody. Let's all stand together. Let's come up in the aisle. Let's make a circle together as best we can. Let's come up in the aisle. Let's make a circle and join hands. Come on and join us. Get those prayer brothers and come and join us, too. Pray those in the tent. Come on and join us. Let's have this prayer together. worthy of his promises. None of us are worthy. But his promise is for us if we simply believe. Jesus said all it takes is mustard seed faith. 
That's, if you have that much faith, that's enough. He will hear our prayer. Let's join hands. Touch somebody's hand. Let's make a pact together and pray to the Lord our God. Our dear gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your visitation among us here under this tent tonight. Thank you, Lord, for letting us live to see this day. You spared our lives from many dangers to bring us here tonight. Some of us are here tonight in this circle, Lord. We didn't even intend to be here. But somehow you led our steps this way because you had salvation in mind for us tonight. And we thank you. We give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. You are such a loving God. We don't deserve you, but we thank you anyway with our whole heart. Tonight, oh God, as we close this service, we pray, O oh Lord, the strength and power of your holy angels to surround us, each and every one. We pray that we will walk in light, defended against the powers of darkness. We claim the blood of Christ over every evil plan that the enemy has for us. He's already defeated, and we do not have to be afraid of him. So tonight we claim victory in the name of Jesus. Our power is in him. Our faith and our strength is focused on him and not on ourselves. When we feel challenged, when we're afraid, all we need to do is call on his name. And he'll send his light. He'll send his angels to lift our burdens. Help us to believe that, Lord, and put it into practice. Instead of giving in to despair and fear, teach us to lift up our voice and sing one of the songs of Zion. And we know heaven will respond, Lord, and angels will sing beside us. Open our eyes, O oh God, to see what is really at stake. Help us to realize what's really going on in this world. Not to walk around blindly as though we don't know it's the end of time. Open our eyes, O oh God. Help us to be aware and to live our lives as those who are on the brink of eternity. Because that's exactly where we are. Rain down your Holy Spirit on your people, O oh God. Pour out your Spirit in latter rain power. We long to be infused with that power from on high. We're tired of mediocre living now, Lord. It's time for spiritual strength in your church. Rain down your power on us. And make us the people that we can be by your strength and power. Enlighten us. And then, Lord, give us power to enlighten the lives of others. As we leave this place tonight to go our various ways, O oh Lord, keep us in your care. Help us not to turn back from the decision that we made this night to never turn back. And Lord, when in our weakness we fall into sin, help us to get up quickly to confess our sin and get right back in line with Jesus again. May we never turn away from him again as long as we live. And on that final day when he will come in the clouds of heaven, oh, and we know he's coming soon. Amen. On that day, may we be among those who look up and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. And we will praise you forever in a world that will never end. We pray this prayer in the glorious name of Jesus, our Savior. And all the church said, Amen.